Our second speaker is Dr. Ray Wyman. He will be giving his presentation on being human, the view of an astronomer. Thank you so much. So can you hear me okay? All right, well, I want to uh, echo Brian. His fantastic talk is going to be a very tough act to follow, I must confess. Uh, but congratulations to the people who organized this. Uh, and congratulations and appreciation to the other five speakers. I've heard all five of them. It's, it's been a really mind-stretching experience for me. Um, and especially congratulations to you folks. Uh, I, I know what it is to uh, go through all the hassles and, and rigors of, of uh, undergraduate life. You've got so many demands on your time and yet you had the intellectual curiosity to actually come out here and, and listen and learn and uh, pat yourself on the back because I think it says uh, a lot about, about you. So uh, this is my title on being human, the point of view of an astronomer. But to, to tell you the truth, uh, I got a little mixed up and I wasn't sure was I supposed to be talking about being an astronomer, the point of view of a human, or was I supposed to talk about being human the point of view of an astronomer. Well, I need to explain what I mean by these two things. I'm going to talk mostly about this, um, but I should say that when I sat down with Brian Scott and we sort of looked at the schedule for the speakers, I decided that I really wanted to be paired with Brian Priest because I've always been intrigued about the connection between art and science or art and mathematics uh, and in particular, from my point of view, between music and science and mathematics. So I'm going to stress that aspect of it. I'm not going to talk about, as, as Brian uh, didn't, I'm not going to talk about what it means to be human, what are the essential characteristics of human. Instead, what I'm going to do uh, are to list just some of the characteristics that I think we all agree are, are essential qualities of a human being and then apply them to what I think it takes to be a productive scientist. And then at the end, I'll reverse this and talk about uh, this topic from a slightly different point of view. Um, but here we go. So what are some qualities that we think are essentially, quintessentially human? Imagination, boy, you just heard that in spades uh, from the last speaker. Uh, a vivid example of, of imagination, what if, visualizing things. Uh, but then all of these others, the capacity for hard work, mastery of the basics of one's discipline, an, appreci an appreciation of the ascetic. That clearly has a lot to do in, in music and, and uh, science in general, although you may not appreciate the role of the ascetic in science. And then finally, being able to take advantage of serendipity. That means just plain dumb luck, but being aware of, of the things that turn up uh, in serendipity. And they've led to some amazing advances in astronomy and science. So that's the program. That's what I want to start out doing. Um, so imagination, what if, whether you call that intuition or uh, creativity, you, you, I think you know what I mean by that. Uh, and I'm going to look at this from a, an historical perspective. So let's go back about 2,500 years. And can you tell me who this gentleman is? Pythagoras. Yes, Pythagoras. He of the famous theorem over here uh, relating the areas in uh, a right triangle, probably the most famous theorem in all of mathematics. What I think is, is perhaps not so much appreciated is the other remarkable work that Pythagoras did, and this was 2,500 years ago, and he was able to study the relation between musical intervals and the lengths of vibrating strings. And he discovered this remarkable relation between the intervals that our ear hears and the lengths of vibrating spring, uh, strings. And I've got a, an example of this if we can get the sound system to actually play. Let's give it a try. Ratio of two to one. 
ratio of 3 to 2. Ratio of 5 to 4. All together. Complex ratio. Now, to me, that last um, chord uh, has uh, sort of the feeling of scratching your fingernails on, the, on a blackboard, whereas most people would say that that beautiful chord was very pleasing and, and harmonious to us. And I don't really know if the physiology of that is understood. It has to do with those simple ratios being what we call commensurate. And I've wondered if this was intrinsic to all human beings or if it really reflects uh, our cultural uh, heritage from the times of the Greek to the, the Europeans. Um, if anyone knows about any studies about this, I'd really like to hear about it. Uh, last night we heard an anthropologist who studied indigenous people in Bolivia, and I would really not like to know if he took those sounds to them and asked them which they thought was the most pleasing what they would say. I honestly don't know how that's going to turn out. Well, let's move forward a little bit in time. Uh, here are two gentlemen that you may recognize. Now, this fellow here, uh, if you walk out in the lobby, you'll see another portrait of him. It doesn't look very much like this portrait. This, of course, is uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, probably the, the greatest musical genius who ever lived. I chose this portrait rather than one looking out in the, the lobby because it seems to me to represent him as more of a human being. If any of you uh, saw the, the movie Amadeus, you know that he had a rather ribald, uh, you, you might even say vulgar, sense of humans, uh, humor. So he was a very human uh, composer, but had this spark of genius. And then I'm sure you recognize this fellow over here uh, playing his violin. Einstein was said to be quite a respectable violinist, uh, but he had a special reverence for Mozart. He described uh, Mozart's uh, music as being the following. That music was so pure that it seemed to have been ever present in the universe, waiting to be discovered by the master. And for his part, Mozart himself exhibited very early on a great talent for mathematics as well as music. And in fact, all through his life, he had an affinity for numbers in the, the opening uh, part of his great opera, The Magic Flute. Uh, the numbers three and five occur with these chords, these pleasing chords that I played. So there is this wonderful connection between music and science or mathematics that has always fascinated me. Now, obviously, imagination and creativity are at work in, in music, the, the things that, that uh, Mozart did. It's less appreciated, I think, what role imagination plays in science. Now, in the case of Einstein, he is known for what are called Gedanken experiments. These are thought experiments where you imagine and say, what if, what would happen if? And in this case, he's imagining himself standing here equidistant between two telegraph poles and a lightning bolt strike them simultaneously as far as he is concerned and he sees the flashes of light arriving at the same instant of time. But the folks here on what is evidently a pretty high speed rail line, uh, they're moving forward at three-fifths of the speed of light and to them those two lightning bolts have not occurred simultaneously. Now that very simple thought experiment, that act of imagination, coupled with some simple postulates based upon some famous experiments done by fellows named Michelson and Morley, led to the special theory of relativity. So there's imagination at work in spades. Well, um, this is not the only example, of course, of imagination at work. My gosh, there are people now on the forefront of physics, people who deal in what are called string theory, who believe that reality really consists in 11 dimensions, not just the four, that three of space and one of time that we're, we're familiar with. But they're so compacted and curled up in incredibly tiny 
uh, sizes that we only sense the three dimensions of time, uh, of space and one of time. And then there are people, physicists, who are seriously interested in the notion of parallel universes. So scientists must have, I think, vivid imaginations to really create uh, modern progressive science that takes us well beyond what we understood just 100 years ago. Well, let's go forward a little bit and look at one of these other properties, the capacity for hard work and the mastery of the basics of one's discipline. Now, obviously, these are not unique to human beings. I mean, busy little bees and ants work their butts off. I mean, they are incredibly industrious critters. But I think that these qualities are also necessary for scientists to be successful as well. You know this story about uh, the tourist who went to New York and uh, he saw a fellow he thought was a musician because he was carrying a violin case and he says, excuse me sir, uh, but how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And you know the answer, practice, practice, practice. That's how you get to Carnegie Hall. Well, a friend of mine uh, had a similar experience. Um, this is the uh, famous 200-inch telescope on Palomar. And uh, you can see this here is uh, what we call the catwalk. Uh, the catwalk is where we go out um, at night if we want to see if it's, it's really clear. Uh, you can get a good view of the sky. And if clouds are coming, you can shift to another object in the sky or maybe change your program a little bit. But also, we like to go out uh, during the afternoon, relax a little bit. We've spent some time setting up our equipment, and so we'll just go out. If it's a clear day, you get a marvelous view of the, of the surroundings. But uh, of course, there are always tourists milling around down below, and if they see one of us up there, they'll say, hey, buddy, how do you get up there? And my friend, who is a good friend, a, a British astronomer, he says, bloody hard work. So that's how you get up there. So those are really essential ingredients. Now, uh, getting back to Einstein. Uh, Einstein developed this theory of special relativity in 1905. If you ask any physicist what happened in 1905, he'll say that was the Annus Mirabilis, the miraculous year when Einstein produced four incredible papers that really transformed physics. But it wasn't as if these things just poured out nonstop without any effort. What he wanted to do next was to generalize the special theory of relativity to incorporate gravity, which had been left out of special relativity. And he did this by starting off with another Gedanken thought experiment. And he imagined an elevator out, far out in space where there were no massive body. I don't know what an elevator was doing out in space, but that's what he imagined. Um, so let's talk about a rocket ship itself. A rocket ship goes out in space far from any massive bodies. So to all intents and purposes, there's no strong gravitational field out there. But the rocket is accelerating, and the guy has an apple in his hand. And of course, at the moment he releases it, the apple is moving right along with a rocket ship. But because the rocket ship is accelerating, the floor catches up with the apple. And this fellow thinks, gee, I must be in a gravitational field because that apple is falling just like it does on Earth. That concept that you can't tell the difference locally between acceleration and a gravitational field, he called the principle of equivalence. And he used that to generate ideas which he hoped would lead him to the general theory of relativity. But it wasn't so easy. He worked incredibly hard on this theory. Uh, if you look from 1905, it wasn't until 1916, 11 years later, that he finally succeeded. But what he had to do was abandon some of the, the purely physical ideas and instead rely more and more on ideas of mathematical elegance. So again, I would say that has a touch of the aesthetic in it. Mathematics may not seem to you like an aesthetic uh, subject, but 
physicists look at his final equations and say those are beautiful. Uh, someone once uh, said to Einstein, Professor Einstein, suppose that uh, God made the universe so that general relativity isn't correct. What do you say to that? And he'd say, that would be really too bad for God because the theory was so beautiful. So that's another aspect, uh, I think, of, of what we mean by um, incorporating the aesthetic and into science. Um, now, the other side of the coin, though, is that even someone like Mozart, who we think of as being so spontaneous that the music just flowed right out without any effort at all, even him with Mozart, it took quite a lot of, of effort to master a certain type of, of musical composition, namely the string quartet. So Mozart decided he would try and master that uh, style of composition, and his mentor in that sense was his dear friend Joseph Haydn. So let me read this to you because I think it's a very touching letter from Mozart. Uh, it says, a father having decided to send his children out into the wide world felt that he should entrust them to the protection and guidance of a famous man who by good fortune also was his best friend. And here they are, distinguished man and dearest friend, my six children, by which he meant the six string quartets which he dedicated to Haydn. But then he said, they are to be truthful, the fruit of long and laborious efforts. So even Mozart, with all his, his spontaneous genius, had to work very hard at uh, some aspects of composition. Okay, let's move on a little bit further then uh, and talk about an appreciation of the aesthetic. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually ever gone out and seen the night sky and a really beautifully clear moonless light totally away from any artificial light. When was the last time that any of you actually did this? That's sad. No one raised their hands. There you go. I hope you will do that. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly moving and magnificent sight. Um, particularly if you go down to the southern hemisphere. My wife uh, accompanied me on several trips down to the observatory in Chile, and there in the southern hemisphere you can see part of the Milky Way that you cannot see here from the northern hemisphere. And, and it's brilliant. The, the stars in the Milky Way are so bright that she was able to walk back uh, to the dormitory w without uh, a flashlight. And she doesn't consider, I think, herself to be a particularly religious person, but she said, you know, Ray, that, that was like a religious experience for me, seeing that. So just the night sky itself um, is, is a powerful aesthetic impulse, to my way of thinking, to doing astronomy. Uh, she's not the only one who felt this way. Uh, since I, I wanted to be paired up with Brian and talk a little about art and music, um, you probably know who the artist is here. He was evidently inspired by the night sky and in fact, you can see he actually drew one of the constellations. This is the Big Dipper, and this is an actual uh, photograph with the uh, lines connected. So here's the bowl of the Big Dipper, and here is the handle. So the, the night sky is, has been something which attracted Van Gogh particularly, and I'll show you another famous illustration of that. Now, again, I think I'm probably... Um, prejudiced, but I think astronomy offers the most beautiful, striking examples of, of scientific beauty. I have to tell you, you might think that astronomers are very blasé about this. Uh, I mean, we're very, very busy, and we can't be bothered with looking at these pretty things in the sky because we're glued to our computer terminals and so forth. But when I was teaching at the University of Arizona uh, to freshmen, I offered a prize, and the prize was for the five top students in a class of maybe 100 or 150 or so. They got to go up 
to the telescope with me. My wife and I would get some donuts and hot chocolate and up we'd go. At that time, um, I was director of the observatory. If you heard uh, the speech, uh, the talk last night about status, uh, you recall that uh, status meant uh, the ability to, to be very strong or uh, to be a leader in the community. Well, I had status conferred on me in a sense because I was a director of the observatory and so I could make out the telescope schedule and say, now Mr. Astronomer, sorry, but out of your three nights observatory, you're gonna have to give up about 10 minutes so the kids can come and look through the telescope. And of course, the astronomer, my watch much too important, I can't remember. <laughs> but, but they had to do it anyway, I made them do it. But here's the funny thing. We got to the telescope and we pointed to some object. And who was the first guy out the door wanting to be the first to look at the object? In this case, Saturn. Well, it was the astronomer. Um, so they really do have this sense of beauty. Again, I'll ask the question, how many of you have ever looked at Saturn through a telescope? Okay, I still find it a breathtaking sight. And if those of you who have not done this, I urge you to do it. There is a, a telescope right here on, on campus. There's an astronomy club. Uh, find out when they're open sometime and take a look at some of these things. Now, I'll talk just a little bit about science, but I don't want to spend too much uh, time on it. But uh, Saturn, as you may know, this beautiful system of rings, these are not solid disks. They're actually made up of a tremendous number of tiny little particles, the remnants of satellites that got too close and were ripped apart by the tidal forces exerted by Saturn. And in some of the pictures, taken with the flybys uh, near Saturn, there is incredibly complex beauty and structure in these ring systems. I wish I had time to show you some of them, but I think, Brian, you would be blown away by some of the intricate patterns in, in Saturn's ring. So uh, here is another object. This is a, a comet. If we're lucky, every 10 years or so, a uh, big ball of ice way out in the outer parts of the solar system gets bumped around by other gravitational forces and it gets thrown into an orbit which takes it near to uh, the sun and then the sunlight boils off some of the material from the comet and causes it to glow and we see these magnificent sights in the sky as I say, typically maybe once every 10 years or so. So when you read in the paper or you hear that there's a bright coming, a bright comet coming, try and take advantage of that and take a look at it. Now I'm gonna show you some other pictures, again, just for the aesthetic, I think the aesthetic beauty of these. Many of these are taken with a Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, these are pillars of gas and small particles. We call them dust, but just very small particles. And inside of them, uh, stars are forming. So stars go through a life cycle just like humans do. Here they're born, uh, they grow up in the vigor of youth, uh, producing a lot of heat and, and light, and then they gradually get old and eventually they die. And some stars are born in singly, in small groups, while others are born in tremendous groups clusters, we call these globular clusters because they're rather spherical. The stars in this object are among the oldest things in the universe. They were formed about 13 billion years ago, just a little bit after the Big Bang. And I'll talk about the Big Bang. I think Brian mentioned the Big Bang in, in uh, his talk. I, I wonder how that firecracker thing actually worked. I'd, I'd love to see that. Um, but then, as I say, stars eventually die. Uh, Sometimes rather sedately, uh, they blow off little puffs of gas and then like dying embers, they just kind of fade from view and they become what we call white dwarfs, shrinking down to incredibly small sizes, about the size of our Earth. Um, and you can see that they throw off shells of gas which form this marvelously beautiful 
pattern, in my opinion. And then some stars die in, in a cataclysmic explosion. This is the remnants left over from what we call a supernova. This star exploded violently in the year 1054, or we saw its light arriving on Earth at 1054. Of course, it took uh, quite a long time for the light to get to us. But we know that because the Chinese actually observed this object. It was so bright it could be seen in the daytime. We're connected to these, these supernova in a very fundamental way because every single atom in our body, except for hydrogen and helium, was produced inside these supernova explosions. That's where all the chemical elements come from, except for hydrogen and helium. So these are objects within our own Milky Way galaxy. If we could get in a rocket ship and go way, way above the Milky Way and look down on it, we would see our galaxy looking in the shape of a spiral. We call those spiral galaxies. And here is, look at that again, Van Gogh. I think it's incredible that he captured so beautifully the, the impression of this spiral galaxy. Of course, he'd never seen anything like that. Um, I don't know what, what motivated him or inspired him to draw something like this. But in any case, that's the notion of aesthetics in astronomy, and I'm, I'm very impressed by it. I hope that you will get a chance to look through some telescopes. They won't be as spectacular as some of these images, but still um, worth taking the trouble to do that. Okay, the role of serendipity. Again, what I mean basically, accident. But note what Louis Pasteur said, fortune favors the prepared mind. And I've always thought that this might apply not just to scientific discoveries, but maybe to even things that animals happen upon or things that took place early in human evolution. For example, this fellow up here, um, I guess, wants to break open these hard nuts to crack, and, and they're delicious inside, apparently. Now, did he think gosh, you know, I wonder how I can do this. Maybe if I took a rock, and, or did he walk along and notice that a rock fell off a cliff and it splattered and fell on a nut and cracked it, and he said, wow, what an idea. I bet I could do that. But he must have had some spark of intelligence, some preparation in his mind that enabled to him to take advantage of that serendipitous discovery. I don't really know, in fact, how uh, chimps discovered this, and then they passed it on uh, through successive generations. The same with this fellow here. Perhaps he was walking along and there was a stick stuck in the ground and termites were crawling up it, and he said, wow, what a great idea. Um, so I think the role of serendipity applies very widely in not just to humans, but perhaps to the higher animals as well. And then as far as human evolution is concerned, um, how many of you seen, I think, the most famous science fiction movie of all time, 2001? And you remember this fantastic scene where this fellow and his colleagues are having a really tough time surviving, but through, in the movie, the agency of some external intelligence, he sort of serendipitously is banging away with this bomb, but then gets the idea that this could be used as a tool. And in exultation, he throws up the bone, and then you recall it morphs into um, the space station, and that's uh, the basic theme. So serendipity applies. Now, I want to tell you about something that's a little closer to home about serendipity. I hope it's a lot closer to home because it's, it's about me. Uh, I'm sort of related, I guess. But uh, this, this image won't mean too much to you that I'm going to show, but I'll tell you what's behind it. Um, normally, I, I study quasars. These are objects that are at the center of galaxies. They're black holes composed of huge masses equivalent to about 10 or 100 million suns. And 
Normally, because of the blurry atmosphere, we don't see a sharp little point of light from a star. It's kind of a, a fuzzy ball. But suddenly, the atmosphere got very steady. And to my astonishment, I saw three little dots very close to one another. And so we decided, wow, uh, that's interesting. Let's look into that. And so uh, for the next <clears throat> couple of weeks, we, we got some more detailed information about this object. And it turns out that it's an example of what we call a gravitational lens. And Einstein showed <clears throat> that light can be belt bent by gravity, just like uh, planets can be <coughs> bent and follow orbits. So what you're really seeing is the same object but the light is following different paths as it's being bent around an intervening galaxy. And it's all really the same object, however. Now, just by chance, again, serendipity, this was the second gravitational lens ever found. It happened that I was involved in the first one. Again, just by chance, uh, about a few months before this happened. But again, my mind was sort of prepared because I had worked on the theory of gravitational lenses many years before. So <clears throat> that's another example. There have been many more striking uh, examples of this, of, of the most amazing discoveries. Uh, several years ago, a young graduate student in astronomy, her name was Jocelyn Bell, and she was looking at the strip chart recordings from a radio telescope, and she noticed little wiggles and little jiggles on it that looked very suspicious. She went to her professor and said, what, do you, what is this? And he said, oh, it's, that's some human influence. It's noise because no real object in nature could possibly produce these little blips. Well, because she had the prepared mind that said, I'm going to look into this and really check, she discovered that it really was coming from outer space. And this led to the discovery of what we call pulsars. Pulsars are the remnants of the supernova explosions. The star contracts to the most incredibly high density, and as it does so, it spins faster and faster and faster, and it shoots off beams of radiation so that they may occur as fast as a thousand times a second. Now, her professor got a Nobel Prize for this discovery. She got a plaque or, or something like that. Who said life was fair? Um, but anyway, there's another example of serendipity, but the prepared mind could make something of it. Perhaps the most startling uh, and amazing discovery of all was another one made by two scientists at Bell Labs named Penzias and Wilson. And they were trying to get their radio antenna to work really tickety-boo but it had some extra static in it. And they thought, maybe it's bird droppings or something in the antenna that, that's causing this. But they kept working and working, and pretty soon established that, in fact, it was due to real signal from outer space. And this turned out to be the leftover remnant from the Big Bang. And it was absolute proof that, in fact, the universe, incredibly uh, as it may seem, did start out in this enormously hot, dense phase it was filled with this fireball radiation, which cooled, and they had detected the remnants of it. Uh, in order to finish up, I'm going to skip over. This fellow, George Gamow, will just mention that, in fact, that mine was already prepared. He predicted that back in 1948, no one paid any attention to him. It went unremarked upon. Penzian Wind and Wilson got the Nobel Prize. Poor old George was forgotten. Again, who said life was fair? So that's the role of, of serendipity. Now, I want to go back to this other side of the topic. Uh, on being human, the point of view of an astronomer uh, rather than the other way around. And here's what I mean by that. What are the qualities a scientist should have to make them human? I wish they had. But for that matter, I wish the same thing uh, was true. What qualities I wish humans should have to make them more human. Now, I have to tell you, I'm going to um, get
get on my soapbox and you might as well be prepared for it if I can do this without falling off. I'm going to launch into a tirade. So just accept it, face the fact I'll probably get reprimanded by the organizers of this, but I feel very strongly about this and it's something I feel that I want to talk about. Um, what I mean is that I'm concerned that in our elected bodies and in public discourse, there is now um, politicization of science for political purposes. And on top of that, it's becoming more and more common for the scientists who deliver messages which people don't like to hear to shoot the messenger and rather than listen to what they're really saying. Um, in particular, there is this notion that everyone's opinion should have equal weight. I'll tell you just a little story about that. Uh, when our oldest granddaughter was uh, going through third grade, we'd like to visit the schools and see how uh, they were coming along. And I'd give a little talk on astronomy, and I probably talked about the solar system, and afterwards there was time for kids to ask questions, and this one kid said, you know, uh, Mr. Wyman, my mom was kidnapped by aliens and they took her to Mars. Now I could have said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, because that's what I really think. But I didn't, I sort of made light of it. And I said, well, gosh, you know, I, I hope that they gave her a good space suit at least, because otherwise she'd have a tough time surviving on Mars. And I was not being, not disrespectful, but not taking him too seriously. Afterwards, the teacher said, you know, Mr. Wyman, in our class, we give everyone's opinion equal weight. And I thought, wow, is that the way this fellow is going to teach critical thinking. Um, I hope not, but that's the kind of thing that I see happening now. Now, so now here comes the, the tirade in the, the lectures. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. As some of you know, I've become very interested lately in educating the public about climate change, human-caused climate change, and the fact that it can have some serious consequences. Not everyone agrees with this, this gentleman here, Senator James Inhofe from Oklahoma, has made the following statement. Much of the debate over global warming is predicated on fear rather than science, really. Uh, the threat of catastrophic global warming is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. All right? There's an opinion. How much weight should we give to Senator Inhofe? Here's another very recent example. The Tennessee House, this happened just uh, one or two weeks ago, by a vote of 70 to 23 shielding teachers who doubt evolution and global warming. And the House member, Bill Dunn, said, the bill's intent is to promote critical thinking in <laughs> science classrooms. Really, I have my doubts if that really was the bill's intent. So those are two opinions. How much weight should they be given? Here, a couple of other opinions. Uh, climate change is occurring, the earth is warming, and these are largely caused by human activities. Climate change poses significant risks for, and in many cases is already affecting, a broad range of human and natural systems. This was the opinion of the National Research Council in a report from the National Academy of Sciences. So who do you give most weight? Who really understands the science about this particular topic? In terms of evolution, here's another report. Uh, some have argued that science teachers should teach the controversies surrounding evolution, but there is no controversy in the scientific community about whether evolution has occurred. The evidence supporting it is overwhelming and compelling, also from the National Academy of Sciences. Now, the next example, I, hes I hesitated even to bring this up because it's, it's prob probably the most sensitive controversial uh, and emotional topic you could possibly imagine. So I want to emphasize I'm not taking a position on this social issue by showing this slide at all. What I am trying to do is show you this trend that disturbs me about neglecting good science or misrepresenting it. 
And here's another thing that occurred in the Indiana House of Representatives. Uh, they, a bill was passed that said that a doctor has to inform a pregnant woman orally and in writing of the following, the possibility of increased risk of breast cancer following an induced abortion. What do the scientists say? Well, the American Congress of Obstetrician and Gynecologists finds no link between abortion and breast cancer risk. The National Cancer Institute says having an abortion or miscarriage does not increase a woman's subsequent risk of de developing breast cancer. So what I'm concerned about, again, is the misuse, the misrepresentation of science to further some particular social position. Now the other aspect of it that greatly concerns me are the attacks on scientists who are not presenting messages which are to the liking of some individuals. I have a good friend who's also in the business of giving talk about uh, climate change and the underlying um, origin of it and its consequences. And he was on a radio talk show and following, I think he was paired with, with someone like Rush Limbaugh, I'm not quite sure, and, and you can imagine the, the, the nature of the discourse that took place there. After that, he sent me a copy of the email. Uh, this one fellow wrote, you seem to be among the greeny commies left over from the USSR. You are a disingenuous, Bible-thumping right-winger. Are there any political scientists in the audience? It strikes me that this is a really neat trick to be both a greeny commie left over from the USSR and also a disingenuous Bible thumping right winger. Well, <laughs> this, this fellow shrugged it off, but there are more serious uh, issues of this. There is a very well known climate scientist by the name of Michael Mann. He has a very distinguished record. You can see he was selected as one of the 50 leading visionaries in science and technology by scientific. American, so someone who really knows what he's talking about, but people have disparaged his work. Uh, he still works, or at least he gets paid, apparently very well, for projects with his name on them. Someone else said Michael Mann at Penn State should be in the state pen, not Penn State. Well, this has had a, he's been harassed, a call before committees to testify, he's had his email uh, subpoena, and on and on and on. And you can imagine the devastating effect this has had upon him emotionally, uh, not to say what it's done to his, his research career. Now if you think, well, what's the big deal, so what? Let me uh, illustrate a couple of, of things in history which cause me concern about the direction in which we seem to be heading. Um, I don't know how many of you, are there any biologists in the, the audience? We don't seem to be heavily weighted with scientists this <laughs> evening, but have any of you heard of Lysenko? Yeah. Uh, well, you can read about him, a Soviet agronomist who was director of Soviet biology under Joseph Stalin. He rejected Mendelian genetics in favor of some other theories and adopted them into a powerful political scientific movement. What do we think today of Lysenko's agricultural experiment? Research is largely viewed as fraudulent. This had consequences. This had a devastating effect along with Stalin's policy on Soviet agriculture. Here's another example, again, not very pleasant, but this is what happened. Uh, Nobel <coughs> Prize winning German physicist viciously attacked relativity and Einstein declaring the theory a Jewish fraud. We still see echoes of that today. This fellow Andrew Schlafly, who is Phyllis Schlafly's son, uh, in a post said that theory of relativity is part of a liberal conspiracy, part of an ideological plot, and he added a list of counterexamples which he said disprove Einstein's theory. So I am concerned about this. Now the question is, well, so what? What should we do about it? And I was struck by Brian's talk, completely different discipline, but he's engaged. He's engaged in, in a way that connects with people and addresses social issues. And that's what I think we should all be doing. Um, I hope all of you get engaged and stay engaged, whether this means through artistic expression, whether it means understanding some of this basic science, 
whether it means becoming politically active, writing letters, working on campaigns, I really think it's, it's vital to do this. Um, if you don't, there is this famous um, instance of Galileo who was persecuted by the Inquisition for holding heretical views and carried to an extreme case. This is what happened to a fellow named Giordano Bruno who had the temerity to think that there could be other worlds perhaps inhabited and for his pains he was burned at the stake. So if we don't do anything, there is this famous quote from Edwin Burke, and you can see all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good man, and I've added women, do nothing. Now, you can say, well, what, what should motivate you? Did any of you hear on Sunday uh, the Jennifer Clay talk? Yeah, well, you recall that she, end, she ended it with, I thought, a very touching picture of her daughter. And as you know now, she's going to expect twins this summer. Um, and that drove her, I think, in her search for truth and to connect to people. Um, I'm driven by something similar. You know, the maternal instinct is very, very strong. But if you think the maternal instinct is strong, don't mess with a grandpa. So here's what <laughs> drives me. So that's Kaylee, and I'm thinking when she is my age, and I'm very, very, very old, <laughs> I want her to live in a world which is pleasant and sustainable, and not the one which I think we may be headed for if we don't take some of these problems seriously. So I'll get off my uh, soapbox, and I hope we can have some civil and rational discussion. Brian said that he would like to participate as, as well in, in any uh, questions you have, but thanks very much, and thanks for participating.